Hello and welcome back for another Torah Tuesday. We're continuing our trek through Exodus and we're in Exodus chapter 17. We're going to do verses 8 through 16 today, the battle against Amalek. Before we do, I just wanted to thank you again for watching these videos and traveling with me through the book. It's been so helpful for me as I go back and review the chapters that I've written for my Exodus commentary and decide what to share with you. So thanks for joining me on this journey. If you are liking these videos, please share them with a friend so that more people can join us and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of them. I love hearing comments from you and interacting with you as well. So thanks a lot. All right, reading from my translation of Exodus 17, 8 through 16. Then Amalek came, and they fought with Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us. Go out, fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I myself will be taking my stand upon the top of the crag with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did, just as Moses said to him, by fighting against Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur ascended to the top of the hill. So it was that whenever Moses raised his hand, Israel dominated, but whenever he rested his hand, then Amalek dominated. Then the hands of Moses grew heavy, so they took a stone and set it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on this side and one on the other side. So his hands were steady until the sun set. And Joshua weakened Amalek and his people by the mouth of the sword. Yahweh said to Moses, Write this memory on a scroll and set it in the ears of Joshua, that I will surely wipe out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So Moses built an altar and called its name Yahweh my banner. He said, A hand toward the throne of Yah, a battle for Yahweh against Amalek from generation to generation. Okay, so this story takes place also at Rephidim, just like last week's story where the Israelites were complaining against Moses for the lack of water. Rephidim is an unknown location, but it's somewhere quite near Mount Sinai. This is the only battle that takes place in Exodus. Even though the Israelites came out of Egypt armed for war or organized for war, this is the only time they actually use their military organization and fight a battle. It's interesting, though, how little this passage says about the battle. We don't know how many warriors fought. We don't know how many died. We don't know what their strategy was. We don't know how many of the enemy were killed. It's a, it's a very sparse account, focusing instead on Moses' role as mediator. Now, first, before we talk about Moses, we should say a bit about Amalek. Who is Amalek? Amalek is a descendant from Esau through his concubine. We read about it in Genesis 36, verses 11 and 12. The Amalekites were a nomadic people with chiefs. And so they lived kind of here, there, and everywhere throughout the Sinai Peninsula and in that wider region. The attack here is unprovoked. Israel is not the aggressor. Uh, Amalek is the one who's being aggressive. We learn in Deuteronomy 25, verse 18, that they had no fear of God and that they attacked the stragglers be who were straggling behind the people. So this is an unprovoked, aggressive attack uh, very vicious, and it seems to be for no reason. One possible reason that might have motivated an attack is access to water. Maybe the Amalekites were concerned that the Israelites were going to take their limited water supplies in the desert. Obviously, finding water was a big deal, as we saw in the last story, but we're not told. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, when God calls Abraham, and tells him he's going to make him into a great nation. He says, whoever blesses you, I will bless, and whoever curses you, I will curse. This is an example of the latter. Uh, this is a people who are, in effect, cursing Israel, uh, attacking them, and th that puts them on the wrong side of divine intent. 
Joshua is mentioned for the first time in this account. He becomes a major figure later, but this is the first time we meet him. It's kind of interesting that we don't get his genealogy. We don't know anything about him. He's just appointed to go out and fight a battle. That will, of course, come in handy later, this military experience, because Joshua is the one to whom Moses passes the baton, and he goes into the promised land ahead of the people and leads them in battle. He also becomes Moses' assistant. We're going to see him go partway up Mount Sinai with Moses uh, to, to experience the presence of God. He seems to have hung around with Moses as a kind of assistant or protege and uh, he is, in fact, on the mountain with Moses when the golden calf incident happens later in chapter 32, which uniquely qualifies him then to survive the wilderness generation and to lead the people into the promised land because he did not participate in that apostasy. We learn in Numbers 13, verse 16 and 33, verse 11, that Moses actually changed Joshua's name so his name, uh, for starters, was Hoshea, which means he will save. And Moses changes his name to Yehoshua, which means Yahweh has saved. So Joshua has this kind of flexible, uh, vague name that means salvation. And Moses apparently sees an opportunity here to specify that Yahweh is the one, the only one who brings salvation. He doesn't want Joshua to get uh, too big of a head for winning a battle against the Amalekites. He uh, makes sure that everyone knows every time they say Joshua's name that Yahweh is the one who fought the battle. When Moses tells Joshua to assemble people to fight, he says, uh, choose some men it doesn't say warriors. The focus is not on their military prowess because it's God who is winning this battle. Uh, the fact that he weakened Amalek probably means that he inflicted heavy casualties. Uh, again, we aren't told any details about that. Moses is not part of the battle directly, but he engages in it by climbing the mountain and uh, presiding over it in a sense. He raises his hands in the sky and it could be that he's trying to mimic a kind of military standard. People would go into battle with a pole and a symbol on top of the pole of the God who was leading them into battle. And so by raising his staff in his hands, perhaps Moses is simulating that um, and rallying the troops to fight. He goes up the mountain with two companions. Aaron, we've met before, that's his brother, the Levite. But he also goes with a man named Hur, H-U-R, who is, we find out later, from the tribe of Judah. It's his grandson, Bezalel, who designs the tabernacle. And so maybe, maybe the mention of Aaron and her is supposed to get us thinking about how Moses has the support of uh, priest and king. The priestly and kingly lines are, are on either side of him. The word hand, I already mentioned that Moses raises his hands in the battle. The word hand appears seven times in this story, which is probably not a coincidence, the number of fullness or completion. And God tells Moses after the battle is all done to write this down on a scroll. This is the first mention of writing or literacy of any kind in the Bible. And Moses probably had training in literacy because he grew up in an elite context in the palace in Egypt. Only 1% of Egyptians were literate. So it was very rare to be able to read and write. This is where we learn that Moses was able to read and write. But it's interesting to note, and this will connect with some comments I made a couple weeks ago about the authorship of the Torah or of the book of Exodus, the language of the book of Exodus, as we have it today, is not the language that Moses and the Israelites would have spoken. Hebrew had not yet emerged as a distinct classical language uh, by the time that Moses was leading the people out of Egypt. Instead, they spoke uh, what's, what scholars called proto-Semitic which is a kind of early form of Hebrew. And I think we get a little glimpse of that in this story because the sentence that Moses writes down at the end of the story is very difficult to, 
to translate. And it seems like it's using archaic language. And so probably we're getting a glimpse of this arch archaic language that Moses spoke and wrote, which is another clue to me that he was not ultimately the author of the entire Torah or of this entire book. If he was, it would have been in a a previous version of Hebrew because regular Hebrew hadn't yet emerged, as I said. And so we would need to have had later scribes update the language to bring it into uh, the, the form of Hebrew that was later spoken. We have no evidence of any text written in Proto-Semitic by Moses other than this little fragment here. So that's, I find that interesting. Moses builds an altar. We don't know if he offered any sacrifices on it. It doesn't say. Perhaps this is just like a monument to Yahweh's victory. And he calls it Yahweh my banner, uh, Yahweh Nisi. And perhaps he's referring to this standard that he had raised, the staff in his hand. And then he says the sentence that is difficult to translate in verse 16. A hand toward the throne of Yah. Yah is a shortened form of Yahweh, and it's it appears often in poetic contexts in the Bible. A hand toward the throne of Yah, a battle for Yahweh against Amalek from generation to generation. That's my best attempt to make sense of it. If you check other commentaries, you're going to see slightly different versions of that. Some people think that hand should be translated as monument because sometimes monuments are called hands. And so maybe he's describing the altar that he built. Uh, it, it isn't entirely clear. What is clear is that this is the beginning of a biblical theme of conflict and hostility between the Amalekites and the Israelites. Uh, we see it here first, but it, it follows all the way through to the Persian period. So think of King Saul. He attacks Amalek but fails to kill their king, Agag, even though he was commanded to do so. You can read about that in 1 Samuel 14 and 15. Eventually, an Amalekite killed Saul. 2 Samuel 1 verses 1 through 10 tells that story. There are other battles with Amalek, including David uh, battles Amalek. But if we fast forward all the way to the book of Esther, there is this rivalry between Haman and Mordecai. You know the story. Haman, we're told, is an Agagite, a descendant of King Agag the Amalekite, while Mordecai is identified as from the house of Kish, or that is the father of Saul. So Mordecai is from the family line of Saul, Haman is from the family line of the Amalekites, and there's this rivalry between them that is resolved at the end of the book by the king giving the Jews the right to defend themselves against their enemies. So you can read um, that in Esther chapter 3, verses 1 and 10, uh, and Esther 2, verse 5. Um, and then you can read other attacks of the Amalekites against the Israelites. We see one in Numbers 14, verse 45, Judges 3, verse 13, 6, verse 3, and 6, verse 33. And then Moses' final instructions to the people of Israel before he dies is to uh, remember that the Amalekites are their enemies. That's in Deuteronomy 25, verses 17 through 19. So we're seeing the first installment in a long um, tension between these two nations. And it's important for us to recognize that Amalek makes the first move, showing themselves to be overtly hostile against the people of God. One of the lessons that stands out to me in this story is uh, just from this scene of Moses on the mountain with Aaron and her on either side holding up his arms. I love it because it shows us that God does not require self-sufficiency. Moses does not have to do this on his own. And the mission of Israel does not depend upon the strength of Moses. This is a team effort. Joshua's fighting in the valley. All three men are on the mountain. Um, and mo together holding up Moses' arms. So although he's a mediator, it does not depend on him alone. And I think that's an important lesson for us to take forward. I hope this has been interesting to you. Next week, we'll dive into chapter 18, which is the visit of Jethro, the Midianite father-in-law of Moses, to the Israelite camp. And we'll see here a complete contrast 
rather than an adversarial and hostile relationship with the nations, Jethro epitomizes a peaceful one that is possible. In the meantime, have a great week. Mm-hmm.